This is the David Show with David Washington and special guest Lisa Thomas Laurie. They're still your babies. But he, um, he told me after I retired from Channel 6 in 2016, he kept telling me, Mom, you should write a book. Mom, why don't you get started on your book? And being a mother, I'm thinking of him always as this little boy. And I'm thinking he just thinks it's neat to write a book. I wasn't sure I wanted to write a book. wasn't sure what I wanted to write it about. And so he contacted the father of a friend and a classmate. He went to school with a little boy named Bill Tierney, Billy Tierney, and his father's Brian Tierney. And he told Brian <coughs> Tierney, who's a, a, a big businessman in the city in marketing, that his mom wasn't listening to him. <laughs> and that she wouldn't get started on a book. Is it not projecting? Oh, there we go. I'm so sorry. I thought I wasn't hearing myself. But anyway, he told Billy's dad, Brian Tierney, that his mom wasn't paying attention. So he had him call me. And um, Brian said, when are you going to get started on that book? Leland's been giving you advice. You're not listening. And so we had a nice little chat, and then that afternoon he says, Mom, I was serious. I really, really think you could help a lot of people. And that's when I really took it seriously and thought about the trials, the tribulations, and everything I had been through, and thought maybe it would be a good idea to share. But let me start from the beginning. As Margaret so kindly mentioned, my story begins in a little town in Institute, West Virginia. Population about 2,600, unincorporated. Kanawha Valley, in the valley of what we used to call Chemical Valley. Now that will play a role down the road and at some point when I became ill. The fact that it was Chemical Valley and our house sat between carbide, chemical plant, and DuPont. And it wasn't uncommon back in those days for my brothers and I to head to the bus stop and see a yellow powder-like substance on the grass, on our cars. The faucets would run brown water, eat the enamel. You often wondered what it was doing to your skin and your teeth. And as a child, I didn't think too much of it at the time. We just waited till the water cleared up. And, but there were studies done later as I became a teenager and paid more attention that indicated that perhaps the cancer rate was a little higher down there in the area of Dunbar and Institute. The suicide rate was higher one particular summer. So these were all curious factors that would later play a role in my search for what was ailing me. But an institute West Virginia began my passion for writing. I would write plays in school at Institute Elementary School and would cast my classmates in these wonderful little plays and always myself in a starring role. <laughs> and um, I remember one particular time the uh, my first grade teacher, Louise Thompson, said that I could put on the play in the evening for some of the parents and some of the other classes, not just the first and second graders, the third and fourth, and I had a big turnout. And around that time also, around lunchtime, there was a young woman that did a 15-minute newscast. And we had a little television set perched up on the shelf in our classroom, and her name happened to be Lisa Howard. That was my name then. And all of my classmates would tease me because she did 15 minutes of news. As you probably remember, there weren't many women doing the news back then. But she did 15 minutes of news, and I just thought she was wonderful. Her diction, her poise, her confidence. And 
I always felt that perhaps I would follow in her footsteps, but my dream was to become a magazine writer. I went to Dunbar High School, about 10 minutes away. When it came time to graduate from Dunbar High, most of my friends and classmates were going to the college that was closest to us. Um, it was a black college, West Virginia State College at that time. I happened to apply. I wanted to go a little farther from home because I really wanted to have the college experience in the dorm room, not living at home and going across the street to college. So I applied for a journalism scholarship and won this small journalism scholarship to go to Marshall University in the southern tip of West Virginia, about 50, 60 miles away. Um, my orientation year, that was before uh, my freshman year, there was a terrible plane accident, plane crash, you might remember, one of the worst um, sports tragedies in history. We lost our entire football team at Marshall. The movie, We Are Marshall, is made after that. And I, I got to know some of the ball players, and certainly uh, the, the athletic director, uh, who didn't go that year, I ended up rooming with his daughter. But, so there was a, there was a, a, a gray pall over the campus, but it also brought a unity to the students, especially the black students at that time. And so we were very united, and we were very watchful over one another. They were productive years for me. I, um, I had a grant to go to school. My father and mother were barely able to afford the education. My, uh, my older brother was going to follow in my footsteps the next year. When my grant ran out, I knew I needed a job. And an upperclassman I will remain indebted to, but he knew that they were hiring for a weather girl mm -hmm. at the local NBC station. He thought it would, I would be a good fit. He suggested I go down and audition for this position, and, and I did. I went down, and, and mind you, this is nothing like the meteorologist that you see on television today. I, my name was Lisa Howard. I had to know the low pressure and the high pressure, LH. That was pretty easy. I had to know the 50 states. And I had to look pretty nice when I was pointing to them <laughs> and do it all in, a, in about a minute and a half. So I, I did that job, but as I look back, I could kick myself because I don't think I took that job as seriously as I should have. It perhaps was not as challenging, but my mother got to the point where she couldn't watch anymore because I was pledging a sorority. And those sorority obligations sometimes took precedence over the weather job, the weekend weather job. And I would come on with my head wrapped <laughs> in all sorts of things if I had gone to the swimming pool or if I had had something to do for the sorority. And um, just wore some rather strange outfits, she thought. So she didn't neglect it to watch after a while. But what I learned around that time was the power of ratings. And whether it uh, was for a good reason or not, um, the sports director at the time was um, a black man from Ohio, a young black man, about 22 years old, Tom Jacobs. And he told me that the boss, Boss Johnson, wanted to talk to me about my attire. <laughs> <laughs> well, during that period where I was going to report to Boss Johnson, the ratings report came in. So when I went into Boz's, job, Boz's office, he was pleasant and he talked about the weather and the different things and what I'd like to do. And I was under the impression there was going to be a more serious chat. What I learned later was that people were tuning in and that my ratings had soared because I guess people really wanted to see what I was going to wear. <laughs> what a wacky outfit. But, I did start to take it very seriously my senior year, and I asked if I could have a news, um, a news truck, if I could cover some real news and do something other than the weather. And um, I ended up getting an internship. And so they gave me the keys and they gave me a 
news truck and they sent me out to do news. Now remember back in those days we, we had a 36 millimeter camera. I was on my own basically and I remember I did a special. The one thing I was very proud of before I left Huntington was uh, a two-part story I did on the wastewater treatment plant in Huntington, West Virginia. I got big praise for Baugh, from Boz doing that. But it was a wonderful learning ground. And that experience, um, at a time when the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, was cracking <coughs> down on stations to hire women and to hire minorities, I was in the right place at the right time. I was a double minority. And so I got calls from Louisville and Pensacola, Florida, these far out stations. But I had a choice of about four or five stations. I ended up taking the one, taking an offer in Oklahoma City. I had not planned to go that far, but my mother knew someone, had a girlfriend in Norman, near Oklahoma City, and she thought that she could check on me. So I headed out to Oklahoma City and ended up not liking it one bit. <laughs> it was so different from the mountains and the landscape I was used to, so flat and brown. And, but I did learn an awful lot about news. And by that time, reporters were teaming up in pairs. And I teamed up with a young man named Dave Smith. We'd go out to cover stories as a pair. By then we had graduated to a CP16 camera, about nine pounds, you'd heave it on your shoulder. i shoot his story, he would shoot mine, and we'd go back to the station and retreat to a little editing room, and we would literally spice, splice and glue our stories for the evening news. I learned everything there was about uh, putting a story together, but Oklahoma was pretty boring. Um, <laughs> A call came from Nashville, Tennessee, after about eight months. Boss had told me to try to stick it out for a year. But in eight months, the call from Nashville came and, and I had to go. I remember the night I was going to be education reporter, hopefully, if I got this job. And I remember the night I was sitting on the edge of my bed in the hotel room. And I said, let me check out this station and see what it's like where I might work in a few weeks. And I turned it on, and um, much to my surprise, there was a young black woman anchoring the news solo. Had never seen that in my life. 1976. And I was spellbound. I remember the confidence. I thought she was sort of ordinary looking, mm -hmm. but I thought she was spectacular. And it was not just the confidence, it was the voice and the way that she delivered. Uh, and that combination just struck me. And I said, I sure hope when I go in for my interview with Chris Clark the next day, WTVF TV, I get to meet this young woman. I walked in the next day and I spotted her first on the side of the newsroom. The secretary was uh, escorting me to a seat to wait for Chris Clark. And as I approached, this young woman said, well, aren't you a tall glass of water? And we struck, we, we struck up a conversation and we hit it off right away. And I said, I have to tell you how much I enjoyed your newscast last night. I was so, so impressed. I'm Lisa Howard. She says, hi, I'm Oprah Winfrey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the oddness of the name. Well, Chris had designated Oprah to show me around, show me the ropes that day, the stories that she was going to do, two stories. And so I was going to shadow her. And we, we had a merry old time. We just hit it off. She invited me that night. She said, what time is your plane to go back to... Oklahoma, and I told her, and she says, well, don't stay in the hotel, stay, you know, at my apartment. And we realized, we, we came to realize that we were both born the same year, 1954. She had gone to Girls State Camp um, as a representative from Nashville, and I had gone to Girls State as a representative from West Virginia. And 
She had dated a guy named Bubba. I dated a guy named Harvey. And we talked about all those things. And she let me know that if I got this job in Nashville, she probably would not be there because she was interviewing for a job as a co-anchor of the evening news, primetime news in Baltimore, WJZ. It would be a big deal because remember, 1976, there were not many women at all, or black women, of course, uh, only the local television station. So sure enough, we fast forward. I got the job in Nashville as education reporter. She got the job in Baltimore. But we stayed in touch over the years. And I, I spent two years in Nashville reporting, um, anchoring just a little bit, a little morning cut-ins. And a call came from Philadelphia. And I remember talking to Oprah about it. And she was very unhappy in Baltimore. And she talked to me about leaving there. Well, Chicago had picked her up. Mm -hmm. She was um, she was not liked very well, not treated very well by the co-anchor she was with in, in Baltimore, and she ended up being demoted. And it was kicked, uh, I say kicked because it was considered a demotion, but it was to the morning talk show, <laughs> which she excelled at, but she did very well. And Chicago had seen her and offered her a show in Chicago. I was on my way to Philadelphia. The, um, they had talent scouts, talent hunters back there, back then. And I remember the gentleman told me that um, after I came up that the, the management had liked me, but there was one little problem. And would I, I, I couldn't be Lisa Howard in Philadelphia because there was a Mark Howard. They didn't want to be. They didn't. They didn't want there to be confusion. So I said, "Well, that's no problem. I'll take my mother's maiden name, which is Thomas." So I decided to be Lisa Thomas. Went to work there, and Oprah went to do her show. And because of our paths crossing and our connection, I was dubbed the Oprah Reporter. So every time something happened there of any significance, I would go up and report on um, Oprah's show. But Philadelphia was a new ground for me. Um, lucky, I was teamed up with a young man named Jim O'Brien, <laughs> who really took me under his wing. Because in the beginning, I was very, very uh, much a neophyte. I had not anchored before, not a newscast, and I was hired for this job as a newscast on the new news. And I remember one day, after management um, had expressed their disdain for my hair being too big, I had a West Virginia twang they didn't necessarily like. They hired a voice coach from Temple to work on helping me get rid of the West Virginia twang. Her name was Julia Wing. I'll never forget her because she gave me some of the best advice I ever had. First, she told me she really would like to work with a lot more of my colleagues. But since I was the one with the West Virginia twang, she taught me how to breathe from my rib cage and, and how to relax and deliver a story with an international dialect. So I learned quite a bit. Jim, in his unique way, told him not to let management get to me. He Blank them, he said. Blank them. Don't pay attention. They're going to drive you crazy. He said, you're a great news reader. Just do what you do. Now, after I got very comfortable at the news desk, Jim liked to play jokes on me. He liked to have a little fun at my expense. And the one thing he did that I remember was one day I was going over my copy and I had a story on the Schlitz Brewery up in the Northeast, <laughs> beer brewery, and Jim fooled around with the prompter. And sure enough, about 10 minutes later, we're live on the air, and I said, beer. <laughs> he was
was on the floor in hysterics. And I was just trying to do whatever I could do to get through the moment. But he told me later he was proud of the way I recovered. I could get him back sometimes, but of course, you know, we lost Jim very suddenly. Um, I remember telling him that I had an opportunity to go up to New York to, um, to perhaps work there, and he was so upset. He couldn't understand, why would you want to go to New York? You'd be a little bitty old fish in a big pond. He said, you're a star here. <clears throat> well, who wants to do that? And I, I, I resigned myself to the fact that he was probably right, that I probably had the best of both worlds, and that I had, by that time, a wonderful family. I had met and married my husband, and we had one son, and I was doing a job that I always wanted to do and loved, reporting and anchoring. And so I said, you know, Jim's right. About three months after that, we said goodbye to him, Mark and I, one Friday um, evening. And then that Sunday I got a call that Jim had been killed in a skydiving accident. And it, it was like hearing that about a family member. Because despite the enigma that he was, he was probably the one person who cared more than anyone else about that station and the people in it. And that's what some people didn't see, the devotion and the dedication he had to the product. So we vowed to continue on and carry his legacy. And I assumed a lot of the responsibilities and jobs that Jim had done. I became a co-anchor with Mark Howard and I began doing the parades, the 4th of July and the Thanksgiving Day Parade with Dave Roberts. Remember I mentioned the little name situation. One day, before Jim passed, we were all sitting after an evening newscast and Jim wanted to know what, what became of this crazy name thing that we had gone through. And he says, I just learned that your name was Lisa Thomas, but you were really Lisa Howard. And then um, um, they had needed a, a, a morning talk show host, and they found a fellow named Dave Thomas up in Buffalo. And of course, they told Dave Thomas he couldn't be Dave Thomas because they had a Lisa Thomas. <laughs> so Dave had decided to choose Roberts as his name. Oh. And when Jim talked about it, he said, now, who started this whole thing? Mark, I don't, your name isn't Howard, is it? And Mark finally confessed that he was born Mark Mummerstein. <laughs> <laughs> but no, his name. But of course, ethnic names were frowned upon back in those days. So Jim Gardner was one of Jim Goldman. And Mark Mummerstein became Mark Howard, legally. And um, Dave, of course, is really Dave Boreanaz whose son, you know, was on Bones and is now on SEAL Team. So we always called that our crazy domino effect name game, but we had some wonderful, wonderful times. And the next 20 or so years were wonderful for me until a strange illness struck me. The year was 2001, and I was at the height of my career, followed in Jim's footsteps, doing what I love to do. I was in the best health. I was working out daily with a trainer, and I started notice, noticing a strange tingling sensation in my legs and feet. And she noticed a weakness, that it was taking me longer to go up to walk, uh, do my power walking and walk um, up inclines in my neighborhood. And at first I ignored it, like any other professional woman with family and busy schedule. I, I sort of ignored it, thought it would go away. Then I thought, maybe I need a pedicure. So I went and got a pedicure, and of course that didn't do it. Then my husband, who is a doctor, decided you really need to, to see if you can't, um, let's get you a nerve conduction study, an EMG. And it, it's a pretty painful little procedure, but it determined that I had indeed lost about 33% of the strength in my lower leg, my ankles. Now the big question was why? He had a dear friend who had been a mentor in, um, at Jefferson University Hospital where he attended medical school. 
And he took me to him. He was chief of neurology at the time at Lycanol Hospital. And Dr. Edgar Kenton told me that he thought I had a very rare syndrome called POEMS, an acronym, each letter standing for a main feature of the illness, POEMS disease, polyneuropathy, organomegaly for enlarged organs. The E was the endocrinology. The, something was wrong with my endocrine system or the, the patients. Uh, monoclonal gammopathy was the M, and the S was skin changes. I had three of the five symptoms. I certainly had the polyneuropathy. Both legs um, were weakening and painful to the touch almost. I didn't have the O, didn't have any enlarged organs. The endocrine system was, uh, was beginning to kill up hypothyroidism. The blood was a big factor. Normal person's platelets, 250 to 450. Mine were 1.4 million off the chart. And I was beginning, my skin was changing. I was beginning to have a strange little bluish grayish hue to my skin. So he thought certainly um, that's, that's what it was. He said, but I've only seen five cases in my career. And I'm going to be leaving Lankanoa in about three months. He was going to do medical research down at Emory at uh, Morehouse in Atlanta was moving. So he referred me to um, um, an oncologist at Lankanoa and a um, neurologist at Johns Hopkins University Hospital. Both of them followed his diagnosis for about two months and then suddenly they put their heads together and decided I had something else. They said I had CIDP, not CODP, CI, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. It was an autoimmune disease, but what Dr. Kenton had told me was that I had POEMS, it was a plasma cell dyscrasia disorder. It's a blood disorder. But we were still in contact with Dr. Kenton, and it was very hard for him to deduce what was going on being so far away, but he, we went along with the doctors to see what they thought, um, and they treated me with a blood cleansing treatment called plasmapheresis and steroids, and I was out of work for about six or seven months the first time. And I think in my gut, and what I try to tell people who are going through something, is really follow your gut, you know? It's hard to sometimes, because when, when doctors put you on steroids, it masks the symptoms. Sometimes you think you're doing better, and sometimes you don't. But it got to the point where I really didn't think I had CIDP, but I hadn't been studied enough or tested enough to know if I really had poems. So we followed the course. We got a third doc, excuse me, we got a third doctor, a hub, and um, we followed the course for probably too long. Even though we were both educated, and I'm a little embarrassed to say sometimes that as an educated woman married to a doctor, it took us a while to get it right. And I think about, I thought about then, his patients from West Philly and North Philly and Kensington and I'm wondering, how does that little lady in West Philadelphia sort through all of this stuff? How does she navigate this crazy mess and figure out what's going on? How does she know the right questions? We thought we had asked all the right questions. But for two and a half years, I was treated for the wrong illness. And um, I remember I had gone to um, an unconventional treatment facility down in Florida. It was for uh, cancer patients mostly, but it was about diet and changing what you put in your body. And, um, you know, I had the colonoscopy and the cleansing and the seaweed and the cucumber diet and everything. And it was great for a week, and then I became violently ill and was put into a Naples hospital in Florida where I knew no one and 
it was quite the nightmare I describe in my book, except for one wonderful hospital volunteer and a test they did that hadn't been done that helped lead me to the, the right answer. And it was a stomach emptying test. We discovered that my stomach was emptying 33% slower than it should. Once I was well enough to leave that hospital and we went straight for the Mayo Clinic. There had been a, a wonderful doctor at Lankanaw, Dr. Gary Newman. He was my gastroenterologist and I had been sick quite often, not realizing at the time that this illness that had caused my antibodies to attack the myelin, the sheath, sheath of the nerves in my legs, was now entering my internal organs. It soon shut down my vocal cord, where I couldn't project my voice, causing me to have to, 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 to leave work altogether for a while. It sh paralyzed the vagus nerve in my stomach. My attending physicians at the time were certain that it was something separate. They didn't think they were related. I still don't understand that to this day, where Gary, my gastroenterologist, and my husband and I thought, surely they're related. You know, it's affecting my nerves. These are nerves. Nerves are throughout your body. He had been suggesting that we go to the Mayo Clinic. There was a woman there, a wonderful um, oncologist, who, hematologist, who had written the standard of care for poems. Gary had been leaning toward poems all along. It was just very hard because some of the some of those key symptoms have, had not developed yet. So as soon as I was well enough to leave Florida, we went, I went to Mayo. What an eye-opening experience. It was unlike any other medical facility I'd been to. First of all, the artwork and the beauty of it. And then I studied a little bit about um, the Mayo brothers and what they had, had wanted to accomplish when they built this facility. And was convinced that maybe I'll get some answers here. I went through a whole week, eight hours a day of tests. Some I had had before, some I hadn't. At the end of that week, Friday afternoon, I walked into Angela Dispensieri was the little Italian woman who had written the standard of care for poems, and I walked in, and she said, real matter-of-factly to my husband, you have poems. You had it all along. And the doctors, she told us without maligning the doctors, she said, this is why they should have known, but it's such a rare, rare disease. She said, the bad news is it's shutting you down. The good news is I think I have the treatment that can make you whole again, a bone marrow transplant. We were shocked. But she said, you're not strong enough right now for it. She sent me home to build up my <clears throat> my um, respiratory symptom, my pulmonary, and to take more chemo to get rid of the bad cells. And she said, maybe in four or five months, you know, you'd come back. Actually, it was three or four months. I remember I did everything she said. I was determined to get well. And two and a half months later, right before my 50th birthday, I came back and had a bone marrow transplant. And immediately, my symptoms started to reverse. First, the paralyzed vocal cord repaired itself. Um, the tingling in my fingertips and hands, my stomach, my digestion got better. Everything started to slowly improve, except the, the, what started it all. And that, the, the nerves and the, and the pain and the burning sensation in my feet and legs. I had some permanent nerve damage because it had taken so long to get to that place where I knew what was going on. But I thought, you know, I was so thankful that I was still there because I remember asking my husband uh, when we left the hospital after visiting Dr. Dispensieri, I said, honey, she said this thing was shutting me down. Is that what I, is, does that mean what I think it does? And of course he didn't want me to think about that. He didn't want to think about that. And I, I, I wouldn't let myself wrap my brain around it because I never wanted to believe that I was that sick. I was always so determined to beat this. 
And so he said, oh no, she's not talking about that. She's talking about how far you've come. And so I, uh, I went right back to the hotel and got on my computer and looked up the phrase, shutting down. <laughs> and it's like putting an end to, you know, ceasing activity, kill. And I said, oh hell no. <laughs> oh no, no, this is not me. I was determined to fight on. And I have to hand that, you know, strength determination thank my mother for that because um, she was a devout Catholic and either even though I didn't follow Catholicism after I got older she laid in me a, a foundation that was something bigger than me and that gave me a spirituality and, and a belief that things were going to be okay and um, I have to thank her for that because um, I, I knew that there was something, some force that was going to allow me. I felt I had more to do, and so I came through that. And I asked myself, now, what you know, what do you, what have you learned from all of this? And I guess some of the things I've learned is that you have to continue to believe in yourself. That you must be an advocate for your own health care, you have to be vigilant. You have to look up things, know what's going on. Don't put every doctor on a pedestal. Some of them are wonderful and some of them are not so wonderful. And I realized, I think around that time, that when storms come, they don't always come to cause disruption and chaos. Sometimes they come to clear your path. And um, I, I learned that you must love yourself. You know, you love yourself enough to give yourself the benefit of the fact that that love has to be internalized. And I guess Leland was right. You share this with people because you want to help someone. All of us, I think, are here because we want to spread that positive message that when, when something goes awry, when you don't understand, there's an answer. And you can overcome it. You can find that positive answer and continue on. I think I was scared to death at one point that, that I might have to leave Channel 6. And I'm so glad that it was, it was my choice. And they were very good to me. But I knew that eventually I, I, would, I would find something else that was meaningful. And I, I think this just may be it. Both of my sons are back here today. Leland was, Leland was sitting, Langston is standing, and Leland was the one that got me, there's David, I think you know David Washington Lee, he, um, and I have, I have a classmate from back in those days in college, Carol Richardson is here, she and I go way back to Marshall and Huntington with her kids, and Cheryl Glanton, another friend, Anita Warner, so I mean, I am just, so proud and so happy to be able to share this with you, to share my message. My son, thank God, he always wanted to be in wealth management because <laughs> I spent so much money and lost so much money trying to get my health straight. And he straightened my husband and I out and he knows what to do. <laughs> He's here if anybody needs some help in that area. <laughs> he runs my square for the book. <laughs> but he helped us. So we wouldn't have to worry about the, the, the financial aspect of it and giving us advice. And um, I'd be happy.